Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our AI Minds webinar, Empowering the Humanity in Us. My name is Sabina Schneider. I am Chief Solutions Officer for North America at Globant. I've been enjoying Globant for almost 19 years. I joined Globant as a Java developer after finishing my career in AI and robot division well, many, many years ago. Uh, I have the delight to meet JJ here uh, at Globant, uh, our global head of artificial intelligence. And today we have both the pleasure to discuss the relationship between AI and humanity with John Mack, founder of a non-profit organization, Life Calling. John is our, uh, well, our, an author, artist, and speaker with a mission to preserve humanity in the digital age. Please help me welcome both speakers to our webinar. Um, today's discussion is a collaboration between Life Calling and Be Kind Tech Fund, Global's initiative to support startups that aim to tackle the misuse of technology, something that is very, very important for us. Some details before we start the discussion. This webinar will be recorded, so you will receive the recording in your emails soon after we finish. And uh, we will have open the Q&A session uh, at the last 15 minutes of the discussion. So please feel free to post the questions as we, we go on the Q&A uh, section. Well, thank you very much. And with no more than this, let's get it started right away. Um, I have a, an open question to, to start the discussion uh, and we will get it going uh, with the flow. Uh, so can AI surpass our humanity? Can we define it or should we define it? Or how do you think? Geisha, you want me to jump in on this one? Yeah, uh, you can start on this one. So, first of all, very happy to be here. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I mean, uh, right now, just as a just a quick little comment, uh, there's a major war going on right now, which is the war against reality. And uh, tech companies are really on the front line uh, of this battle. And uh, I think the Be Kind Tech Fund, I think this is a wonderful opportunity to enter the front lines uh, with uh, good moral and ethic when it comes to this battle and try and get this right. So I'm really happy to be here. So on that question, the question, can AI surpass our humanity and should we be defining our humanity? So AI is born out of data. Mm -hmm. It is born out of the rational mind. If the human has a limited perception of itself, if the human thinks it is only a processing creature of logic, of reason, of witness, of evidence, if that's what we define ourselves as within that limitation, then yes, AI will surpass our humanity. The question is, are we more than that? And so I don't think we necessarily need to define uh, what it means to be human, but I do think we need to land on where is the machine in us and what lies beyond that and then empower that part of it. If we don't empower that part of who we are, AI will definitely surpass us. The biggest threat to humanity is and always has been our limited, limited perception of ourselves. And so AI is really, it's, it's posing a wonderful opportunity. I don't see a risk here yet. It's posing a wonderful opportunity for us to reflect on who we are, how we're different from the machine, and how do we empower that side of us. Hmm. So I'm I'm going to disagree a little bit. Um, so the, the the view would be that actually it's, it's not as opposed to that. The the idea that AI can surpass humanity as we currently understand humanity might not be as crazy as we think, um, because as as John was saying, when we present ourselves as these overly rational in the terms of processing when you when we automate ourselves then yeah a robot might be more efficient um i think it's it's important to value the the idea that many philosophical kind of uh, currents have about 
It's not that we are human, it's that we become human through our growth, through our experimentation, through our search. And in there, my life, maybe the, the opportunity or the difference, the idea that we believe there's something called humanity within us, we are out to search for it. And in that discovery, in that exploration, there is a space that we are ever expanding. Whenever we have tried to define it, we come into a lot of problems like, oh no, only humans feel, and then we massacre animals. Oh no, only um, the lives of humans important, then the, the environment suffers. And then, so defining it might be the problem. And I'm fine with a little mystery. Um, but the point is, we don't need to go overboard and, and maybe assume that there's going to be something so special that could be preserved unless we work for it. Like, um, the, 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 there might be a relating question whether there's something special about humans, and I think that there could be if we create it. Um, but the, the risk that AI surpasses us has to do with this idea that we've shown ourselves to be liable to be mimicked, and if we think about the origins of AI, the idea is, well, can a machine do something that we believe requires human intelligence to, to be performed? And for many tasks, we have been kind of um, surprised that, hey, you know what? It was more mechanical than we thought. And that's not a, a plus for the machines. That's saying, well, why were we acting so mechanically? Um, and and I... I think it has to, it might have to do with the history since the Industrial Revolution, maybe, and the idea of trying to have everything on an assembly line or, or, or standardize what we do so we can be between ourselves replaceable. Um, but uh, unless we start rediscovering and enhancing and improving that part of ourselves, yeah, they will surpass us. Yeah, I so, feel that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, Sabina. Sorry, uh, at some point I, I thought we were talking about the Schrodinger's cat. Uh, so if you define something and you open the box, now it stops being what it is. So uh, I would like to know your perspective on on the tools. Uh, are we in charge of driving the tools uh, and talking about AI and technology in general, or we are in a position where the tools are driving us? And, and I, I would like to know the the comparison between the, the efficiency you were talking about uh, being more efficient in what we do uh, and using the robots to to do that or or really aligning that to the the purpose of of humanity in itself. Okay, do you want to start there? Yeah, I, I can start on this one. Um, I think we were discussing something like this the other day, uh, John, when we were thinking about we're following our tools like children with toys, like where, hey, can this uh, light on fire and then we burn a whole building and then it's arson and whatever, because we're just kind of have these powerful things and we're just trying them out everywhere and see what happens there. Um, and so at the moment, I don't think we are driving our tools, but rather letting them kind of drag us anywhere. Uh, that's not going to be good in 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 too many senses, not only the, the risks of actually burning something, but also because we will get used to that. We will get used to our tools telling us what to do, how to do, where to do, and everything. And comfort is uh, quite a drug, and it's quite addictive. And we might kind of become zombified in the sense of looking for that comfort because, hey, ChatGPT can write it for me. Um, and this other tool can suggest what I should be consuming. And this other tool will tell me when and where to exercise or what. And then it's going to be a machine that's going to be exercising for me. And then, so we will remove every effort that we have to do. We will remove every uncertainty. And then there's nothing to drive the tools to because there's no decision to make there. Um, and, and, and this idea of efficiency, I think it's extremely powerful. As an engineer, efficiency is kind of at the core of our beliefs, right? Yeah. Uh, everything needs to be more efficient. But there's there's a limit there. Otherwise, you fall into the, the meme, you know, the years ago, there was this Arnold Schwarzenegger talk where uh, somebody was talking about competing and, and he said something like, sleep faster. <laughs> like, what was the point? <laughs> What's the point of speeding up something if you enjoyed the act of doing it? Um, so efficiency in itself is not a value but doing something with a purpose with more efficiency should be 
because if you have a purpose, if it's if it's a suitable purpose, if it's something that makes sense, like when we try to improve the world, being as efficient as possible then enhances that. Um, actually, when we're talking about purpose, uh, we'll be um, putting up a report about uh, AI and finance and, and the whole point of the program, it hinges there in, well, yeah, AI can be used, but the point is, what for? Uh, how does that change the way people behave? How does that change the way we make decisions? How does that change the decisions that we can make or not? Otherwise, we will get into the situation like, um, you know, this this book by Michael Endy in Bomo, where there's the gray man that were trying to be more efficient in terms of time and whatever. And then you have a lot of free time for nothing because there's nothing you want to do. Um, so the, the, the whole point is we need to rediscover our purpose because we fall for efficiency. When we do, we will be able to drive these tools. And, and that's a lot of the work we do. And that's a lot of that has to do with the Beacon Tech Fund, including... Uh, including like, how do we make technology work for us in domains and purposes that make sense? Uh, but at the moment, I think we're just following them around because they're cool toys and we like toys. So I just want to, I'll just push back since you pushed back on me at the beginning of this. <laughs> so I'm going to push back. I'm going to say we are driving our tools. I think it's impossible for a tool to drive us. To say that a tool is driving us is to play the victim role. Mm. It is our vacancy, inner vacancies. It is our misperceptions of ourselves. It is the wounds within ourselves that are granting the tool access into ourselves and then shaping our identities. Yeah. And so, yes, you could say that the tools are driving us, but only to some extent, we are open to that happening. And then what we do is we get into this loop. We drive the tools and give our power to the tools. And since we're giving power to the tool, well, when it responds to us, we will follow that response. So it's this constant loop, but it begins at a, at a, at a central point, a source. And that is where we as human beings abdicate our power to the machine. That abdication of power to the machine is itself driving the tool. Are we driving the tool to our benefit, to a thriving species? No. But at the end of the day, or at the beginning of the day, that's where this is beginning, at the human being. Okay, I'll take the bait a little bit. So um, if I understand this, like if we are, let's say, on a, on a driverless car, we're still choosing to get on to it, we're still choosing the uh, address we're trying to go to, and we're still choosing to let it drive us there. So it's us making that decision, right? What happens when that is not an individual choice, like uh, with, with systems like, uh, I, I don't know, finance, health, uh, education, where maybe we are at the end point of decisions being made by algorithms chosen by people, but we felt feel disenfranchised maybe i don't know if that's the word because the result is outside of the domain that we can influence or change would that still apply because behind the lines or maybe at another level there's still a human driving that sure so what you've done is i think in your example you've switched context in the context of what it means to be human and are we thriving as human beings? So you brought up the self-driving car. It's driving us there. That's a that, that's that's using it. So that's a specific tool use. Hmm. You haven't made, you haven't turned. There's no manipulation of illusion and reality in that. And so within the context of humanity. I'm saying we're driving these tools 
in a way that is augmenting mm. our yeah. own manipulations that we already have of ourselves. Mm. But and if, go ahead, please. What if uh, AI, in a, in a way, I, I'm, I, yeah, I don't want to treat it as an entity. So if if we allow AI to be um, to have autonomy, so to train itself, to have a recursive algorithm that retrains itself, what will happen there in, in, in that context? Well, I think we have to understand that if we can all agree that data mm -hmm. is limited, that an algorithm is limited, no matter how, uh, how no matter how much AI learns and trains itself, mm -hmm. Its seed is data. It's born in the limitation of data. And so it will grow and get big. But one thing we really have to understand, and this is important, its limitations are limited. Um, so, so let me, so its limitations are limited. Now, if it keeps growing and gets bigger and bigger than us, then we have to see the limitations are actually without limit. I want. I want to. I want to just be clear with that again. Yeah, please. <laughs> the limitations of AI mm -hmm. are limitless. I wonder if you're seeing that. Uh, okay. Can I can I try to express that in other words to make sure please. that I'm understanding yeah. that? It would be like the, the limitations of AI are potentially limit infinite. But if it can grow itself, then they become unbounded. So it's still limited, but it has an unbounded scope of action. Is that the, the, the direction? Right. So if you think of the a if you think of um think of a dimension, mm -hmm. which is a dimension of limitation. Thought, data. Yeah. Let's call this the dimension of limitation. Now, you can grow infinitely in that dimension, but no matter how big you get, you will still be within that dimension of limitation. And where I'm getting at is our humanity, the fullness of what it means to be human, exists outside of that dimension of limitation. And until we step into what that means to be human, AI will constantly look bigger than us. Because the essence of what it means to be human is a, is a dimension above the realm of limitation. It is a limitless eternal dimension. And this is the problem with transhumanism because if the transhumanist has a limited perception of self, which yeah. is data, reason, logic, pragmatism, evidence, all of that, and they see this machine that has far surpassed us. Yeah, inefficiency, for example. Inefficiency and problem solving. Exactly. Well, then yeah. clearly, if all you, if you are bound and you've never seen anything outside the dimension of limitation, then you're going to say, oh, yes, clearly the next step in human evolution is to merge with the machine. To bring us to that level. But that is a step in progress. That is still along the horizontal timeline of progress. And real human evolution is actually a shift in perception, not a shift in biology, but a shift in perception to a totally different I mentioned a new way of living. Okay, let, let me push back a, a little bit then uh, this time. Because there's a part where, where I, agree. I I like the idea of uh, thought as, as a dimension of limitation that can be infinite, but it's still one dimension. Um, it's like our ignorance. Still strikes me that we are begging the question in philosophical terms when we talk about this limitless domain of humanity. So like, I do believe that as a working hypothesis, it, it's useful. Like, 
there should be something to look for. We should strive to grow into something more as, as a suitable objective. But I'm not so sure that unless we get very mystical, we can assume that there is. And, and it might be that in the end, we find, I don't know, millennia from now, we find out that we're just atoms and, and maybe that's it. But that uncertainty, that, that idea that we don't know, but we believe there's something to look for, it's a powerful engine. And, and it's something that it makes sense to follow. I don't feel as comfortable assuming it's there. Even, even if internally, religiously, philosophically, one believes it's there, it's still, for me, a, 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 still a bit of a leap of faith to say it is limitless in that sense. Okay, so let's put it this way then. Do we agree that thought and data are limited? Yes, at the moment. Begrudging. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it is. Do we agree that thought and data has been sort of the central gravity of humanity pretty much since the dawning of recorded human history? I mean, even religion is a system in a sense. It makes sense. Yes, absolutely. There's, yes. A, there's, a, there's, a, there's a system in the mind there. There's a logic, yes. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think just the question we want to ask ourselves is the following. Are we satisfied with where we are in the world right now, with the way things are going? And if not, what would need to shift? And that's it. We don't have to believe that there's something, something limitless out there. We don't have to believe that there's a deeper essence of humanity. We don't have to believe any of that stuff. All we have to do is look at the fact. The fact is this. We're acting like animals, more primitive than animals, really, because we're not even fighting for biological survival. We're fighting for psychological survival. And that's really primitive. And so I would just say, look at the facts. What needs to change? What needs to change? And I wouldn't say so much out there, but in here, where have you bought into limitation as being the sole reality? And then if you can if you can switch that off, then you can decide whether there's a limitless dimension or not. But until you've done that, it's just belief. And we certainly want don't want to be in the uh, the realm of belief because belief is belief is always Belief is always a manipulation of what is. Belief is always a not knowing. I don't believe I'm speaking to you right now. I know I'm speaking to you right now. <laughs> yeah. And, and what we want to land on is fact, not belief. Because when you're in belief, that's when things get manipulated. That's when the line between reality and illusion really kicks in. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, I, I can get a little bit more on board with this idea of the the need for change and, and whether we accept where we are or not. I don't really want to get into the fact as reality discussion because that's going to take another hour and we will not solve it probably. That'll take um, days. <laughs> in, right, in, in the sense that um, like the, the, the basic uh, doubt that we might have about, well, am I well, not dreaming in this particular moment, but uh, whether what we perceive is, is actually there, whether we're confused, whether uh, we are projecting something, because that adds a whole other dimension. But I do agree, and I think it's a, it's a good point to start a discussion to say, well, we do agree that upon examination, our place in the world, the, the, the way things are being conducted could be improved. We are not satisfied with that. This is not an, an end state we want to stay in. And starting from that and starting the search, I think it's a it, it's a common starting point that we can build from. Well, I, I do want to say on that point of reality, and I I also don't want to discuss. You know, I mean, like we we, we could discuss what reality is. I'm happy to go there, but I want to say something, and I get this a lot. Um, 
people will say, because I speak a lot about virtual reality, augmented reality, and someone will say, well, what is reality? And uh, when someone's asking that question, I was just speaking at Stanford, actually, and someone asked that question and standing at the podium. And I said, well, are you standing there asking me that question? And he said, well, I don't know. I mean, you could say, and I said, no, 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 no. Are you standing there and asking me that question? Because here's the, here's the, here's the, the importance about saying yes to that question. We, I don't think that reality can be a philosophical question anymore. Not in these times. We're going to arrive to a time in five years, 10 years, where with AI and the manipulation that's happening with deep fakes and voice fakes, we're only going to know 100% for sure if we're speaking to someone real when it's face to face. And the moment somebody says, when you're face to face, oh, well, maybe this isn't reality, then you've taken the carpet that you've taken that one last ground that we have that we can agree on as real. And you've pulled that carpet from under us. And once you do that, everything can be manipulated. And so I think it's really important in this day and age with where the manipulation is going that when someone says, hey, John, are you in a webinar right now talking at a table here in front of me? I just say, yes, I am. And I leave philosophy for some other time. Mm -hmm. If, if we do that, uh, what it will, and, and we know that uh, manipulation is going to happen or is actually happening, uh, what is the humanity would like to to preserve to keep it, uh, and and which will be the steps to to accomplish that to to keep that humanity that we we want to keep, and what will be the um, the humanity or, or or the process of what we do the activities that we do on a daily basis that we would like to, you know, give it to the manipulation, the AI, the automation, the efficiency piece. Major, I can jump in, but if you want, go ahead. Well, I was thinking a little bit, uh, probably the, the, what we want to preserve and, and what it means to be pro-human in this sense, for me, it has to do with the sense of agency. Like, uh, are we enabling people to make their own choices? And, and make their own choices doesn't mean just pushing one button or the other, but rather making up the options, uh, being conscious about what they're uh, choosing and the consequences of that and, and why and the reason for that. Um, but it's not only about the, the individual and how you kind of, Agency and liberation seem to have something uh, related, like the, their capability to affect the world in a meaningful manner, but also to choose in which way to affect the world. And that ties to the second aspect, which is kind of the community part, like the connections between people. Because as, as, as John was saying, it, we're not so far away from a completely virtual relationship sphere, where maybe our friends will be chatbots, even though uh, that nowadays that seems a bit far ahead, but within the, the virtual worlds, within uh, deep fakes, within conversational models, we might as well start having our most close relationships be automated and adapted to us. And so the, the idea of preserving agency and community for me is very important. And the way to manifest that is when we're talking about augmenting um, human capabilities, not as improvements, not as, they, as if they are faulty, but as, as a complement, as an assistance to what they want to achieve, that's going to be the approach to be kind of pro-humanity. The, the things that I, I think might be good to leave behind is, first of all, the way we deal with information, data, and particularly the news, like what we trust in because it's already a little bit toxic, like what sources we believe in and, and how stories are manipulated and, and the narratives that are built upon us. And if we come to uh, to gripes with this idea that any picture, any audio, any video, any text could be a deep fake, then we won't just willfully believe in anything. 
we will start to have to be more critical and and maybe rational is not the the, the ideal word, but we we will have to be more conscious about what we choose to believe in. Um, and also the the idea that, and, and I'm going to stress this out, maybe humanity as we now believe it is not as special, as different from other things in nature might help us increase the scope, let's say, of our compassion or for our agency. Like in the past, we believed that we only we had any sort of feeling or consciousness or whatever, and that when taken to the extreme, was taken even into different groups of people. And so not feeling so special might make us understand that the relationship with everything should be special. Uh, so I, I think leaving that behind might be a net positive, even if, if it will hurt in the process, even if it will, if it will generate uncertainties. But that, that, is, that is the balance. On one side, agency community, on the other side, um, how we trust or believe in information as to leave behind. And something in the middle is that feelings and emotions have this kind of primal grounding effect on us. Uh, I do believe that is our connection to, to reality as, as you were describing it, John, like um, you feel it in your gut and that is very powerful. That is very primitive. And we want to have a, a balance. We don't want to uh, numb those feelings in, in a overly intellectual kind of approach to life. But it, we don't want to overexcite them until we get addicted to that dopamine hit of that just that know the thing and become addicted or driven by this external kind of uh, stimulus. Yeah, I appreciate that. I would say to that question of what part of the equation does humanity want, right? Um, it's the human wants to be itself, period. In order to enter a virtual reality, so in order to enter a false environment, let's just say the metaverse, for example, you can't even appear as human. You have to be an avatar. So you, your persona has to match, your inner psyche has to match your outer environment. Okay, and this gets deeper. That we're it's going to a place. There's a place I don't want to go with this because it's going to get too abstract. But the same. So I was born Catholic, and I was an ultra boy, and uh, I had to wear my red and white robes to play that part. So I had to alter just how I looked to be in that environment. Mm. If you're a Buddhist, you might be a monk wearing a different. At the end of the day, the human just wants to be its natural self, completely non-identified with a persona. So when we enter artificial environments, which I think are important, we're doing it now, right, on this chat. Yeah. We'll be doing it in the metaverse. I mean, all of this is coming. We're, you, we're not going to be able to stop te technology. I mean, that train has passed, but it's not too late to learn how to interact with it. And I think that's what this webinar is really about to some extent. And so that is this. When you are an avatar in the metaverse, just stay aware that you're not that avatar. That avatar is a tool in order to interact within a virtual world. And I think where, where a lot of the problems between illusion and reality are getting distorted is when we forget we're actually identifying with a persona. And so if we could stay true in that sense, that we're using personas as a tool in order to interact in the world, if we can keep that distance and awareness, then the reality between truth and illusion would stay a bit more clear. But until we work that out, yeah. we're really going to be pulled into a variety of different rabbit holes. Hmm. You, you, you just said something that resonated with me, um, but maybe in the opposite direction. 
this idea of uh, non-identification with a persona um, and the idea that maybe we actually wear these different hats, these different personas in every aspect of our life. Um, and then maybe there's a way we identify ourselves at work, with friends, with family, in nature, with animals, with whatever. Um, and there might not be a central core that connects everything, but rather just superimposed personas that we play in, in real life. Um, but that connects to something that, that you were saying about the, the belief. Uh, and this, this is all saying that um, an idea is something you use, a belief is something that uses you. Uh, and, and I thought that that was very closely related because if we are not aware that we're using those personas, then we become tools for those personas to be expressed. And, and that's kind of the, the, the inverse relationship we don't have or we don't want, sorry. That's exactly right. So you mentioned wearing a hat. We wear these different hats. There's the hat and then there's the person that's wearing it. Mm -hmm. If we forget about the person, that, if, if we forget about the person that's wearing the hat, we've lost ourselves in the illusion. So a persona is always worn, which means something is wearing it. And we, when we forget the essence, that thing, and that's that very human thing that I'm talking about, it's that essence that's going to use the persona as sort of a navigation tool in the world. And the problem is that we get so attached to this persona, we, we wrongly identify with it and we lose the essence of our true nature. We become a player in the illusion. So yes, I completely agree, JJ. We, we, we're always wearing different hats. The question is, are we aware of the hat that we're wearing or has it overtaken us? And that, that again is the abdication of power to the tool. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, to that point, uh, and I think that will be at least my, my last question before we jump into the audience to see the questions. Um, is there a way of aligning uh, the hat with a person? Is, is there a way to align uh, what AI can mean to us with what we want to define ourselves as humans? I will say yes. Do I need to laugh? <laughs> no, <I'm laughs> yes. <but, laughs> uh, like closing it there. So I, I think there are several dimensions or, or directions where this can actually happen because I, I am strangely optimist about that. Um, so for instance, if we're talking about how we design these tools and algorithms and, and, and devices and things like that, there's something very practical, which is how we embed feedback capabilities between them. If somebody is subject to the outcome of an algorithm and they don't have a way to redress that, they don't have the tools to oppose to that, to challenge that, then we are not necessarily forcing, but getting people used to, to just leave it to the algorithm. So practically, as, as a company that develops software and, and tools and devices, feedback and the, the, the way we provide a space for feedback is gonna be critical. Mm -hmm. um, but also that the kind of outcome that we should be building into these algorithms should be more oriented towards the how and not the what. Like um, we, the, when we're talking about agency and we're talking about making choices, the truth is we don't want to make every choice all the time. There are things we don't really care about. Like, oh yeah, I have to go to this other address. I don't really care about the way that I go there. I just care that I arrive. Um, but if I'm enjoying the drive, I do care about how I get there because the, the journey is the point. And so in one case, I don't wanna make the decision. In the other case, I don't want the decision to be taken away from me. Um, so what gives us agency in terms of how we deal with decisions depends heavily on the context. Um, but normally when we select the what is the objective and the algorithm help us understand the how to get there, it's going to be much more useful. 
So in, in the sense of something very practical, uh, if I want to see a movie on a Thursday night and I turn on any digital platform, they will suggest a movie for me. That is telling me the what, like you have to see this movie. But maybe that's what I should have a way of inputting that. Like, well, today I feel like being challenged. Today I had a long day. I just want to laugh. Today I want. So it's a way of saying what is my objective in this context, in this moment, and not just me as a whole person. Because sometimes I might watch things with my partner, with my wife. Sometimes my, I might be alone and want to look something else. Sometimes. So the thing is, Every algorithm should be focused towards the how of the objective and not the what. But most of the algorithms tend to be framed as solving the what. Like, this is what you have to do. This is the option that you have. This is the choice we removed from you. Um, and then we have the, the other part of, the, of that, which is, as people, as humans, what do we do in terms of... Um, trying to focus more on values and playfulness and exploration as a way of relating to the world because being interested in the world will ground us and will open up those possibilities or the idea of changing a little bit how we learn, like more philosophical approach to questioning things and trying to understand why and not just um, gaining skills for the skills themselves, but rather as tools to do something else. Uh, but that is kind of the whole game of that. We we have from the way we go to the way we to teach our children. Um, that would be kind of a comprehensive way approach to maintain our humanity, to avoiding the misidentification with the hat and, and to start the search for that kind of human core that we've been discussing. I just want to tag on the end of that rather than answering very, very long. I just want to tag on the end of that. You mentioned play and you mentioned algorithm there. Yeah. <laughs> Creative play knows no algorithm. I didn't say play doesn't know an algorithm. I said creative play. Creative play is revolutionary energy. And the moment an algorithm is involved, you're repeating a pattern, a thought pattern. And what's happened is let our thoughts override the deeper creativity, imagination, inspiration that is a part of that higher dimension of what it means to be human. Hmm. Yeah. And that's why it's so difficult to watch children these days when they don't know how to play creatively anymore because they are so bombarded by brands, by feeds, and by all the information that's polluting their environment. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I, I think that's that's a very interesting point. Uh, have you, uh, recently there's been this, this algorithm that was um, plugged into Minecraft and led loose to trying to find a way around. Mm -hmm. And the the way the algorithm was set up was to optimize the time it took to achieve a given item in the game. And the interesting thing is that, yeah, it can solve the task, but then there's no point in the game because the whole point of the game is to kind of explore and create and build. And people have been building things for, I think it's more than a decade now that the game's about. And it's one of the more kind of creative spaces that we have online. Like what we did with, with legal bricks and things like that in the past, it's just go and build something you want. And once you set an objective, like build its highest towers or find the tool or whatever, you solve the game, but you kill the game in the process. Uh, so I, I do believe that that playfulness is something of the spark that we're looking for. Definitely, definitely. I think we have, we're in a, I think we've learned to worship the algorithm. And I think you can see that just in ed education around the world. We're actually, we're churning out thought pattern. And, you know, anytime government defunds culture, anytime, a parent tells their child, oh, that's just an imagination, or no, you don't draw a cat like that. The house is supposed to be larger than the cat. Anytime uh -huh. we do that, yeah. there's an algorithm that begins to smother, 
something very creative. And we have to be very careful. And there's a huge paradigm shift that needs to happen if we're going to get out of this mess that we've created. Good point. I'm taking that as a tip for my kids, for sure. <laughs> So uh, here we go. We have some some questions from the audience. Uh, one is coming. Thank you, Lydia, uh, Viviana, Sapiola, for for asking the question. How can you have control of something that is more intelligent than you? And I, I will add to that question. Can we define more intelligent? What that means to compare to humanity? Yes, I'll I'll take that if I can, JJ. So. Uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's no such thing as artificial intelligence. It does not exist. What we're dealing with is intellect. This is artificial intellect. Intellect is data bound. It dissects, it separates, it observes. It pulls things into pieces in order to understand them. Yeah. Intelligence is something totally different. Intelligence requires wisdom. Intelligence unifies things. It brings things together. Mm -hmm. Intelligence is what intellect will form individuals, separate societies, nations. Intelligence will bring that together. Intellect on its own will discover atomic energy and blow up a nation. Mm -hmm. Add intelligence to that and you'll light up a nation. So I think part of the problem that we're seeing in this whole digital conversation, and it's, it's a very, very big problem, and it's it helps to pull us down the rabbit hole of illusion. Artificial intelligence is not artificial intelligence. It is artificial intellect. Augmented reality is not an augmentation of reality. It is an augmentation of illusion. The digital cloud does not float up in the sky, in the heavenly realms of the sky. It is underground in subterranean basements. There's a lot of stuff out there that is packaged very beautifully but I, I, I really appreciate this question because it's very easy to rise above an, intelli an intellect machine. And you do that with intelligence and no machine can have intelligence. Hmm. I, would, I would slightly challenge the, the idea of uh, artificial intellect in the sense that Probably we're calling artificial intelligence not as uh, something that exists, but as the objective or pursuit. Like, um, how can we build things that require uh, artificial things that require what we believe to be intelligence to be able to achieve? And that's how we started building it. Uh, so maybe it's not like we believe this is intelligent, but rather this is the means to get to do something that requires intelligence. Okay, well then I understand well, then, that. Is, that's, uh, yeah. Well, then they should label artificial, not intelligence. Yeah, but it's very long. No, but, but I'm serious because people out there are being duped and we need to really come clear with intentions and what these things really are. It's part of the manipulation. Hmm. Okay. But uh, anyway, yeah. going to the point of, of controlling, uh, what I would say is a horse is way stronger than a person. And you can still ride one and control one. So I don't think the relative scale, it's its the point there. It's, it's uh, the, the context is how the interaction happens is the core learning of that. Yeah, I like that. I like that, JJ. Uh, another question that we have is uh, Pablo Al, uh, it, in a view that quantum computers are in a super early stage at this moment, how could this new computing capacity shift the limitations that you have to be in, talk, that you have been talking about, especially on the dimension scale and real time AI capabilities? I'll 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 start on that. So the, the main promise of the quantum computing uh, algorithms has to do with the idea that you can prove every possible pathway and just uh, validate the response. So um, it would help incredibly um, on the time scale of how to train or build these algorithms. Um, it will be a, a massive boost to the speed in which you can execute them but if we go back to what we've been discussing about the limitation of data or 
even if it's self-generated, even if it's referential to um, its same algorithm, it doesn't change that part. It can play scenarios, it can um, train faster, it can adapt faster, but it's going to be functionally more of the same in that sense. Uh, we're not talking yet about um, if we discover new types of algorithms that are feasibly, that not feasible in any other kind of compute. We're not talking about the idea of whether at the quantum level is where consciousness emerges and then we're opening up another rabbit hole. We're talking about if we were to apply quantum, quantum computing to current algorithms, it's like the faster and more powerful, but essentially it's going to be the same mechanics. So I'll just answer this on the dimensional scale if I'm reading that right. The moment you think something outside of yourself can lift the limitations and bring you to a new dimension of consciousness, you've created a savior. And we've seen where saviors have gotten us and they've really gotten us nowhere. So uh, nothing outside of us uh, will lift any limitation. point uh mario sixto gonzalez thank you for the question the unlimited growth of ai can it prove that human intelligence is unlimited too can it even be bigger could ai be considered a tool created by humans that will help humanity extend the front line well I'll, I'll just jump into this really quickly so um human intelligence is unlimited human intellect is limited. And I see AI as artificial uh, intellect, so limitation. Um, and let me just look at the question. Yeah, I think that's all I want to say about that. JJ, you want to pick up on anything there? Yeah, and, and I'm going to be a, a contrarian in that sense because uh, uh, from my background with complex systems, I don't believe in unlimited. I believe that there's always a limiting factor, even if it's in the form of feedback or the system acting against itself. Um, so unless we're talking about like the infinite space beyond physics or something like that, something is bound to hit a limit. Uh, even if we don't know it yet, even if we can visualize it yet because it hasn't grown enough. Um, what, I, what I do think about this idea of the unlimited growth of AI is probably about the pace it feels that it moves so fast that we are assuming the trajectory will continue forward and predicting this kind of behaviors, especially exponential, is quite a challenge because we don't, we don't have a good sense of how that evolves and how the system adapts. At some point, either compute power or the available data or the time to process it or the energy it consumes or something will hit a limit. We're nowhere near yet, but something at some point will hit a, a limit, and then we will have to find a new strategy. That's where uh, the imprevisibility comes from. So I do believe that it can help humans tackle a lot of things that would burden them now, like the way uh, search engines helps us not to be uh, clamped down by memory requirements. Then AI will help us not having to be mindful of some processes that we don't care about and focus on others. We will be augmented in that sense. We will be extended in that sense. Um, but limitless is, is a word I'm very careful with. So I'll yeah. just say right here that you cannot extend what is. What is, is complete in and of itself. You can only extend what is already illusory. So any extension is an extension of a construct. So, <laughs> you know, it's funny. I often give people this exercise when I speak. I say, in five seconds or less, I'm sorry, in five sentences or less, in five sentences or less, describe the color blue. And you'll see when you do that, you can't describe the color blue. You can't describe its blueness. 
Yes. <laughs> you can only idea. talk around it. Mm -hmm. Give example. And if you ask chat GPT-3 to do the same thing, mm -hmm. it will describe blue in the same way that you did. And you see the, and that's where AI is born in that limitation because we program yeah. AI at that point of description. And that can grow and grow and grow and it can extrapolate and get new data, but it will never know, it will never know the experience of blueness. It doesn't exist in that dimension. It would have to be sentient. Hmm. I, I think the, you just touched on a, on a very operative word, which is the experience of, because maybe the color blue you could describe as the wavelength of the electromagnetic uh, field or something like that, but the experience, how we interpret that, that might be untransferable. And the same when, when we ask, like, how does a dog see the world? I don't think we can actually know, um, and, and we try to find ways around that, but the experience of, it's quite unique. Yeah. Yes, I think that we have a uh, room for one more question. There are many, so thank you, thank you again for all the questions. I think that they are great. Uh, this is uh, Ricardo Javier Perez. Studies affirm that in the near future AI will replace certain operational work. What is your opinion about this, and what is your suggestion for the true future? If you could speak to that me of the future, what will you suggest he does today? Hmm. I, I can start on that one. Um, so we we like to think that like uh, work when we're talking about work at last, as two separate things. One are tasks, particular tasks that we do that can be framed and defined, have a beginning and an end and things like that. That is gonna, what's going to be uh, replaced a lot because that can be defined with enough detail as to be automated. And then there's the other part about uh, the purpose of the job, why it exists in the first place, uh, what is it trying to achieve and how that evolves over time. That second one is a little bit harder to automate. Um, but in any case, more likely that an AI replacing job is a person using AI replacing a person that is not. Because it will be a tool. It will be like somebody that knows how to read and write replacing somebody that doesn't. It's somebody that knows how to use a computer replacing somebody that doesn't. And so on and on and on. So the, the most practical advice is to start relating to AI tools like ChatGPT, which you can access for free and play around in a playful manner, exploring that, seeing how you better interact with that. Because that's how that's like learning how to interact with with a not a wild animal, let's say a domestic animal. That's how, like learning how to um, map a, a given field that you typically walk around. That's that's immersing yourself into that experience, so you'll know how to adapt it. Because the whole point of this is that anything that can be so well defined will get automated. So it's on us to redefine the things that can't. Um, and and the ramp up is very hard if you try to take it all at once. But you, if you start playing, let's say with ChatGPT or Midjourney or something like that, you will get a sense about how you experience that, how you incorporate that, how that might help you or not help you in different parts, and then adapt to that. That's going to be the, the practical part. It's like when when we are asked about whether kids should be using a generative AI like ChatGPT at school. Well. I mean, whatever gets their their objectives done, it's fine. The point is, if you're evaluating the kids on the final product, then you're doing them a disservice. If you're helping them understand the process, then you are actually teaching them. And that's kind of what's going to change. So the problem is not whether AI is going to be involved, but rather whether the way we currently define what they have to do is so structured that it can be easily replaced by AI. And I'll just quickly answer that in a totally different way. <laughs> Assuming that AI will take away all of our jobs, I would start today to figure out how to endure boredom. Oh, yeah. I would start that today for many reasons, not yeah. just the reason that, that the question is being asked. Otherwise, you will become addicted to all forms of entertainment yeah. with all that time on your hands. So figure mm -hmm. out a way to be creative 
and not be distracted from boredom. And I think we could all start that yesterday. Yes, oh, fully agree with that. So thank you very much. Thank you everyone for, for the questions. Thank you, John and JJ. I think that we uh, we have enjoyed the conversation in, in drilling down into what AI means, but especially what humanity means. And, and I feel that we have so many other points to touch upon that, uh, that that's amazing, has been a, an amazing time. Thank you. Um, we have gone, well, I, I will uh, keep, uh, the, the last piece about boredom as well. Uh, I think that that's a very important point. Uh, if we think we, we are getting back uh, that time to our lives, what where are we going to do that with that? Uh, and being more creative, uh, as you were saying, JJ, <laughs> get bored, <laughs> get comfortable with getting bored. Yes, actually, that, that could be an option too. Uh, so what do we do with that re repeatability of activities and, and being more creative as well? So thank you for those those reflections. And uh, everyone be sure to connect with the speakers on LinkedIn. We will uh, drop the, the, the links shortly. And also visit please the live calling channel on YouTube for of uh, John. I think it's, it's very, very interesting conversations you will find there. Um, and remember to join us in our next webinar uh, happening on the 25th of June. It's going to be a, about AI applied to finance. So uh, see you there next time and keep you posted. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.